Okay, so today, the first part was, again today, a little bit getting to know Bro's details. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit in more practical, for you probably more relevant stuff. And um, I feel a little <laughs> anxious because you probably know this stuff much better than I do. So if there's <coughs> feedback from your side, I highly appreciate it, or if I'm really going off the wrong track, um, let me know in advance. This talk right now is about network forensics with Bro, and it touches on, on why Bro makes the difference for network forensics. We've probably, many of you have experienced that already, but I just want to give you some more underpinning of that. Then we're going to talk about some abstract use cases of incident response and network troubleshooting that you probably all encounter, but maybe haven't thought about in in that high-level summary, and then we talk about three examples, um, namely that that make Bro really easy for incident response. You have these three examples: is the Kaminsky um, de attack detector, it's the certificate null byte detection, and a Duku detector that I just wrote in the last half hour. Um, so, in general, you have the following scenario. You observe some symptoms of an infection. Um, maybe it's concrete. You send some host send spam, or you just observe some bogus connections. You don't know where they go. Your IDS didn't trigger because it was a complex attack, or the attacker evaded it. Zero day. You don't know what's going on. What you can do then is go back to your log archive, crawl through it, try to find what happened. That's the standard post facto scenario. and Bro logs are very well suited for this task. And the reason is, to understand the reason, we have to go one layer back into Bro's architecture and look where these logs come from. These logs come from events. In the scripting layer, we have a various types of events that span all the networking stack. On the link layer, we could technically handle events like ARP request, ARP reply, on the network layer, we have new packet or packet contents. Usually, we don't use them, but we could if you really wanted to hook into that layer. In that layer. On the transport layer, there's new connections event or UDP request. And for application level stuff, there's HTTP request and HTTP request. These events are, are very rich typed. They're deep. They go into, over the entire network stack and fine grain. The, they go really into the semantics of the protocol, if necessary, <laughs> and they have an ex an, a nested data model. So if you just think about terms of events, not logs, this is, the, this is the previous layer, you already get a wealth of information. And um, it should not end up this way. Rather, you, if you think about these bro logs, these events are then handled by the scripts, and then these generate logs. And they're policy neutral by default. If you don't add local at the end, all your logs are just a reflection of activity of what's going on. So that's great from an incident response perspective, because there's no notion of good and bad in the logs. You, you just get what you see. Nobody coined that information with, uh, that's an alarm, that's bad, that's good. You want to do this after the fact. In particular, if you don't know what was going on, um, good or bad, applying that to a log, um, it's mostly what, what other systems do. They say, this is an alert, 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 um, meaning it's already bad. We, in general, Bro, Bro has these notices. So there's actually a reason why we don't have the term alert. It's because it conveys implicit badness. So notice is a little, little lower in that end. And so far, we have only ASCII logs, but there is planned support for binary logs. And, and the, the C++, on the C++ level, you could just write your own custom logger pretty quickly with the new logging framework. So the bro logs are the, your gold. Good data is gold in, in data analysis and statistics and all data-intensive um, disciplines. Um, so when you have these high-quality logs, what do you do with them? Either you process them directly. This is what we're going to focus on in this talk. You, you can also summarize them 
in time series data, histograms are the top 10, and get generate fancy statistics from it. Justin is going to talk about a little bit about that stuff later with his, on his efforts on, on Splunk. There, there correlation, log correlation is once you have these logs, you want to see, well, um, do these traffic distributions look similar? This, this, do we have the same traffic distribution of HTTP like yesterday? There you can use, for example, statistical distribution tests and see, uh, can actually quantify pretty precisely what, what these differences are and what your confidence is with respect to these differences. And at some point, if you're, if you're overloaded with logs, you, you can just age them out into higher levels of abstraction. Let's say, Bro does that already with, with events itself. Events are just high-level representations of the full byte stream that you see. If you, as a two gigabyte ESO that you download, and uh, Bro just gives you a single line representation of that. You can imagine also at some point, those connection logs, as they get huge, you just want to summarize them in even higher levels of abstraction, like simply traffic matrices, A communicated with B, and then it gets, uh, it gets even, you lose information, but it gets more and more space efficient, more compact, much more high level. So this, these are general things you want to do with logs. How do we do it these days? There's this um, one size fits all solution is like a seam, Splunk, Oxide, Naris Insights. These are, these are available, great tools. They're costly. Martin presented a very exciting alternative, Elsa, today. At ICSI, we have uh, something similar, currently not yet usable, being under development, called VAST. Um, and, and there are alternatives, actually, to, to have this, to this one big approach, which is just you just process the logs, where they are, in C2. You have these files, directories of logs, and you process them. We've learned a little bit of how to do that yesterday. And um, if they're getting bigger and bigger, you can have to resort to more powerful tools like available Hadoop off the shelf for MapReduce like processing. Actually, all this kind of stuff that we do with Sort Unique and Oct, these are very similar operations to MapReduce. You can think about of a shuffle and a reducer, Sort and Unique. It's it's kind of similar, and you might be have you might actually be able to express this in the same same style. So. That's in this in this ecosystem. We now look at some abstract use cases that you probably have all run into. So, for classical incidence response, the goal is to quickly understand what what happened with with an incident. It often begins with a piece of intelligence, such as you know somebody tells you this IP serves malware or this MD5 is malware. In Bro, you can just get the MD5 of the of the HTTP connection as part of the HTTP record if you wanted to. <coughs> so it's, it's readily available. You can just grab it if you want. And if you, if you know this intelligence, um, you just start diving into the data. It's a very concrete point, so, so you, you know what you're looking for. But then from there on, you, you broaden. You spatially look at related hosts, maybe temporarily go back in time a little bit, what happened to the same host before and after. And you often filter the data until you get to a certain point and extract the relevant fields. So um, do a little bit of aggregation with that. That's, that's, that's one flavor that we've done here also yesterday. And the following exercises will be in the same style, too. There's a different approach when you, when you troubleshoot stuff. You don't have a concrete piece of intelligence. You just of a very narrow scope. Somebody tells you, I can't access my Gmail. Tell me what's going on. You don't know. You just have a very broad sense of something is going wrong. Ideally, what you would like to do is, OK, now I look at my dashboard, see if anything's fishy. What are protocols looking similar? Is there anything spike in activity going on? This is a Splunk. Uh, so Justin's talk probably touches on that. It's studying of time series data of various granularities. Mm. For example, if you find all of a sudden, today we see 20% less outbound DNS than compared to yesterday, maybe something with your DNS is wrong. And uh, that's the reason why actually Gmail can't be accessed. So that's, that's a different style of approach um, that, that is exactly the opposite of the previous one. You have no concrete starting point, and it's a top-down. You just go from the, from the 
top into the details. And there are some links that you can click on when I made the slides available for some um, extra information. A very uh, difficult problem is combating insider abuse. And um, this is so hard because th it often consists of chains of authorized actions. And um, these are hard to detect because they consist legit activity. And they often span longer time periods. And that's um, the classical example is data exfiltration, where somebody shuffles data around an entire company until they find a good point where they can move it out. Um, it, activity profile comparison might be interesting com operations on that. If you see, well, John never logs into a backup at 3 AM, then it's a legit action, but it's, it's, not, it's not what it usually does. And Seth actually told me yesterday, some, as OSU, they found a security incident because there was a grad student working at night. And all of a sudden, the light of the hard drive for the machine next to him went on. And usually, at this point of time, there's nothing going on. And just because the students sat there and looked, this machine started going up, they found an, they found an attack. Um, so this, this is based on um, temporally, often distant events, behavior-based detection. That's the kind of um, touchstone in this slide. These are three use cases that you probably all are involved with and trying to solve on a daily basis. I just wanted to summarize them and keep them in mind when we now go to the third part of the presentation, which is um, very practical driven. And it explains the process of you have an idea of something and then try to poke through the logs a little bit, find something and want to make that, you find something interesting, want to codify it as a maybe attack script that you run in your system from there on in the future, and thereby close the loop. It's just, you find something and add something new to your engine that then creates an alert whenever you, or an alarm notice. <laughs> I should have used this consistently. Um, when you, you know, when the activity occurs in the future. So let's start with a, one example. It's um, the Kaminsky attack has been presented at DEF CON a few years back. It, it's based on the problem that vulnerable DNS resolvers do not randomize their DNS source ports. So uh, if you want to find vulnerable hosts to this attack, you just uh, the first step is, so what do I need to identify it? You try to get to the data, which is DNS in this case, resolver address, and the UDP source port. Then you, the next step would be, OK, how do I express this in terms of an analysis? Um, for each resolver, no connection should reuse the same source port. That's, if, if your source port is reused, then maybe it's not random. Um, and an alternative way of phrasing is that, that the resolvers should use random source ports. You can um, then try to express this analysis slightly differently, closer to your implementation, such as count the number of unique source ports per resolver. Uh, by default, Bro gives you this information in, in the DNS log. If you, if you extract the resolver address, the, uh, the, in this case, it's the resolver, the responder port, the uh, source address and the source port, DNS source port, and from the DNS log. And look now, uh, is the destination 53 for UDP? This is just a sanity check, because there are various types of DNS. There's MDNS, NetBIOS also uses a form of DNS. So if you really stick to the standard DNS requests, we just filter again, do this, um, restrict our analysis to port 53. And then we sort those pairs of, of resolver address and source port. And whenever we find a duplicate, we print it. We print that address. That's the dash D switch in unique. So that will be a very quick analysis to see if something is going on. But this is not a perfect analysis. This is really just scratching the tip of the iceberg. It's really not measuring the quality of the random number generator. There are much better tests for that. 
it's, if there's a crummy implementation that just increments linearly the numbers, that's, uh, the host is probably still vulnerable to a, a slight variation of the Kaminsky attack. And eventually, if you have a resolver that is under high volume, you will have port reuse. There's just 65,000 of different values there. So you might want to restrict this analysis to a certain time interval, maybe an hour. And maybe then you can at least have some confidence about, about the quality of your resolver. So once you've understood this attack process, the final step would be to close the loop and write a bro script that does the same that you just add to your deployment. And at that point, you don't have to worry about it anymore because you get notified each time there's a new resolver that doesn't re randomize the source ports. How would that look like? It's, it's a few lines, actually, in bro. We have a set of resolvers. Usually, you don't have too many DNS. Or you have some set, probably pretty easily enumerable in a bro script in your, in your network. Then you keep track of the ports per resolver. So it's a table per resolver of the set of ports that you see. And here, let's say in a high volume environment, you just want to expire each entry, each port that you see after an hour to not make the set explode and eventually say, oh, OK, obviously the server reuses ports and, uh, and it, because it just has to serve so many DNS requests. Then we hook the event DNS request, which contains the connection, some other arguments that are irrelevant, extract the originator, which is, which is the resolver. And we only continue this analysis if the resolver ad address is the one that, that we have listed previously. So if not, we just bail out early. Then we extract the source port and look at the source port if if it exists already in our resolver set, if it does not exist in our set that we've seen in the past, which is this per resolver set of ports, we add it. And we add this source port for this particular resolver, and then finish. And so if we reach this point, we know that we've seen the port before. And we can just say, notice, maybe source port not randomized of that resolver. And you get notified. You can use all bros tools to send you an email and the way you want to be notified. Questions so far? So that, that example is kind of a run through from the beginning um, of identifying an issue, going through the log, scrolling a bit through it, and then closing the loop, writing the corresponding bro script, installing that into your life. This is how I think about incident response makes a really, you, if you find something that makes it viable in practice. Let's look in, at another example. Uh, there exists an issue with, used to exist, patched mostly. If you register a certificate like this in the CN, the, the certificate, the registration authority would allow you to register that under the domain attacker.com. But the problem is this null byte inside there. And actually, I probably have to choreography. I use not two L's here because the ASCII representation in the table is called NUL. And it comes up all the time. Seth yesterday had, uh, was complaining about that. But it's the correct rep representation if you refer to the ASCII byte and not just the value null. So it's a side. <laughs> um, on the client side, though, if you, if you present the client a certificate that has this value in the CN, the library that used at the client to parse <laughs> the certificate stops parsing at the zero terminated string. It's a C library. And what you get is a valid certificate for PayPal.com. So this, if you would look, as an incident response, you would say, hey, maybe is somebody using this attack on my network? This looks really like a low-hanging fruit that somebody might want to implement. Um, same sequence of steps. We look at the relevant data. In this case, it's, it's not a lot. It's just a common name field in the subject field of the, of the certificate. And Bro does all the hard work. It, it decodes the ASM1 encoded cert, gives you the event there. You, you really have not to do a lot. It's, it, the whole analysis boils down to looking for a zero in, in, in the subject. And you can do this readily in the logs by extracting the subject field and the connection identifier, 
This is just to get the reference. Um, I wrote a little awk script that extracts the CN. This is uh, not relevant for now. It parses the subject fields, which is a key value pair of lines. Um, and if there's a null character in there, you just print the connection UID and go with that in the con log and pull out the, the, course, the offending connections. Uh, this is, well, yeah, OK. So again, always reflect on what's, what's, what's the issue here? What am I doing? Where are the limitations? If the clients are patched, this is not an issue anymore. The attack is just an attempt, but still worthwhile detecting. Software that Bro enumerates various types of client software that it sees. You could imagine looking at the user agent there to see for if that matches vulnerable hosts or hosts that might have a vulnerable OpenSSL implementation. Um, and if the man in the middle attack that is used to inject the certificate is going downstream of your monitor, you, you get, it's just not the traffic. You, you can't see the injection going on. And in this case, you might not even see the attack in the first place. So there are some limitations. Um, the last one with the you know, defense in depth monitor deployment sensors also inside your network you might get around with. But we can also do this, write a very quick bro script to do the same thing. And all of this is just boilerplate to extract the CN value, to get in this local variable the value of the CN. Because this OpenSSL gives you the subject as key value pairs, so you have to do a little bit of bro string processing to extract the value, the CN value. But this we probably write, wrap up in a utility function. And all you have to do then later, check if a null byte is in the CN, you do the notice. That's the whole code to detect the attack. Other questions? OK, so I, I'm pretty fast. I've, I'm glad I have a third. Oh, that's actually. That's the, what is that? That's the same thing in awk. Oh, well, yeah. OK, no. Um, in this case, there's an, a third step that you might want to say, well, now I've seen something weird in CN. What else could be weird in CN? In the CN, um, Seth talked about that earlier. If I have a wildcard certificate and it does not match, the wildcard does not match my server name, then there must be an inconsistency somewhere in the, in the protocol. And how do I find that? I'm not going to go through this arc example, but rather I'll show you a little demo that illustrates that, that quickly. Um, OK. Can you read that in the back, or is it? Better. Okay, so this is from the trace two thousand nine something that you also have on uh, on your on your laptops. Um, it's just the output of brocut server name and the subject of the SSL log. And usually it looks like there's a server name, uh, and then in the subject line there is the CN, and that should should match. And if we go through it, it matches, matches, matches most. Oh, then here, mail.m57.biz, but the CN is star.mail.dreamhost.com. So these, there's an inconsistency. And uh, this little script that was displayed earlier on the slide just looks for that. And um, if we run it, we extract those entries in the SSL log where this mismatch occurs where we have mail.m57.biz and star.mail. This should not happen. The mail, the server, the SSL server name should be the same as the one that's listed in the CN in the subject. Other questions on that? OK. So then let's go back to the slides. Yeah, this is the corresponding awk code. I, this time, I didn't want to do it in Bro. I just did an awk. It's um, same thing could be done in Bro. Okay, so third example. Um, Dooku, you don't have to say anything about it, I guess, at this point. It's uh, an instance of 
pretty fan sophisticated piece of malware. Um, what do you want to do if you want to actually detect it and broke? Uh, that's what I just thought earlier on. It's not too hard. Um, if you look, try to get the network fingerprint of this piece of malware, and often <laughs> it will do something. Otherwise, it would not be worthwhile. Otherwise, it would just they sit there on, on the single machine and wouldn't spread. So this, in this case, I looked at two reports from Symantec and McAfee, but uh, probably those reports, and Paul, I talked with Paul about that yesterday, as soon as they're released, they're irrelevant <laughs> mostly because these th things adapt pretty quickly. But sometimes you might actually be as try to just extract very generic pieces, something that must happen, even if the actual value is changing constantly. But say the protocol itself is usually a little more stable to changes. And I try to find those invariants in the behavior of, um, of what was going on. And a machine usually starts with an, and, and I look, this is just part of the semantic report. It does an HTTPS exchange initially to establish a session key that is used later on over an unencrypted session to, to encrypt data. So it's an AES session key. Uh, the second step is that this piece, uh, that Dooku sends a request with a specific cookie value. And the server responds with a 55, 54 times 54 white GIF as a result. Um, and the third step is that the, the infected machine sends a post and uploads an HTTP <coughs> post, uh, uploads a default JPEG file, and there's some stuff, information about the machine itself, and the server sends a zero length, 200 OK HTTP reply. So that's, to me, that seems something, okay, I can detect that. That's, I, bro, bro provides me all these protocol, high level protocol details where I just have to hook in. Uh, this is, uh, in a fact, actually, Duku also uses some sort of Samba um, CNC if it can't reach the external CNC. So if these all, if all these steps fail, uh, Duku tries something over Samba. I have not looked at that in detail. So um, if you, as an incident responder, would think, how do I, how do I detect this beast? Then um, you kind of have to go through the sequence of steps and. This can be seen as a state machine. It's one state has to be reached, then the next state occurs, and so on. So I will never see the third state before the first one. And um, that's the classic idea is you just follow the state machine. Just follow the state machine. And this is a little harder to do in uh, ARC. <laughs> so I'm just doing, trying to do this directly in Bro. Um, and, and, and while doing this, I'm, I'm aware that this is just a really a very coarse-grained attempt to do it. But um, I didn't even have a trace, so I, can't, I haven't yet verified it. I've just tried to now to give you some ideas, some samples of how that would look like in Bro. And in Bro, you would, uh, because this is HTTP stuff, uh, you probably have your analysis centered around the HTTP module. And I, whenever I, I see something, I would like to be notified with a new notice, potential Dooku infection. And um, I need two more values. By default, Bro does not give me the cookie value. And it also does not give me the content type value of the HTTP header. So I add these to the, to the info record, that, which I can later access with C dollar HTTP C dollar HTTP. And inside, then I have cookie and content type, which don't exist there. This is a quick way of extending it. We, we, we hook, I don't have this displayed, but what I also do, I hook the event HTTP header, and in this header, I populate these two values. So right now they exist in the record, but um, in order to have them available later in, in, I, in the request or reply, I, um, I have to populate them. And that's what we do in the, in the header. So then this is the entire state machine that how I really simplify Dooku. It just first a GIF request, then there comes a GIF reply. Whoops. Then uh, there's a JPEG request and a JPEG reply. This, so this is how I think about Dooku in its very simple way. And, and I track the infected machines in a, in a table of addresses, and I, the value of this table entry is this state machine. And so then I go into the HTTP request, and from there, from there I look, well, do we have a GET request? 
And it's a sequence of, of, of many different conditions that have to, to match to really filter out the right one. Does the PHP session ID is some value in there? And actually, the McAfee and the semantic report, they have different values there. So I just say, OK, well, I don't care what value it is. It's just here we have this value is consistent. It always starts with the PHP session ID. That's what we need in there. Um, if that occurs in the cookie, uh, then we need another condition to be true. The host value, actually, I haven't said that earlier. The host value is an IP address in this request. It's the IP address of the infected machine. So this way, the CNC knows the IP address of, of, the, of the victim. And it's a, it's a, it's a uh, request to slash. There's no, no path. If we have this, I record the first state. OK, so this, the client that did this request now entered the state give request. Le later on in the HTTP reply, I look. Well, is the source in, in my potential Dooku hosts? And, and if it is in, the, in there, is it in the state GIF request? Because I only really want to re look at the reply that corresponds to, the cor to this GIF request that I sent earlier. And then there are some extra conditions that need to be fulfilled. We have need to be a version HTTP 1.1. Status code needs to be 200. And the content type that I added earlier on needs to be GIF. And if that's the case, I go on to the next state in my state machine as I defined it. And that's the state GIF reply. And maybe here I can already say that might be already enough evidence to at least notify me somehow. This could already be a potential Duke infection. So I might, I might want to do it at the end of the entire state machine or already in the middle based on how, how re reliable this, this just this two request response pair with this handshake, how re reliable that is. Um, if anybody of you has a Dooku trace, I'd love to test it out and refine the detector. So um, yeah, please come talk to me afterwards. Then, that, oh, that's actually, that's, that's just an, that's a, this is just a excerpt of it. The next thing that would happen is, after I'm in the state GIF reply, there's the JPEG request coming. And I, if, you, if you download the code of the Dooku, the Dooku.ro, I, I, I'll post it. You can see that there's then the next, the next check. If I'm in the state GIF reply, there's a follow-up request coming. And so this is, this is going to be added again here in this, in this handler. And then there's another HTTP mm, reply piece of code that is handling those, the corresponding JPEG requests. So this is how you, this is my way of, this is how I think about <coughs> implementing multi-stage attacks or complicated, uh, complicated pieces of malware that have some network behavior that you can express quite generically. This, this is how, and in, in bro, it's really not a lot of code. I just stripped out, it's, it's just repeating itself. It's, it's, not, it's not complicated. You can readily, from the report, it took, I sat there while Seth was talking and did this. It's, it's, it's really, it's, you can do it quickly. It's, um, it's a prototype, and it might give you already what you want. Other questions? OK, I'm pretty much done with my talk. so. We can get into early lunch if there are no questions. Over lunch, I'd, I would appreciate if you read the exercise background story that is also linked on the, on the agenda, because all the next exercises will be in this, framed in this context. It's a little, it's a little story. Um, there we'll do some similarly looking exercises as to those in the example that we just had. And then uh, this is just another repetition of the agenda. Mm. We have two, two exercises. One, they're both, they're both more advanced and um, hopefully also a little bit more interactive. If you, um, if you have questions during these exercises, feel free to just talk up and, uh, hey, I have this question. How do, you, how do you track in HTTP the blah, 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 blah. Something like that. It's, just, um, it's, it's probably benefiting more of you if, um, if, if you articulate your questions. And that's 
we hope that enriches the experience for everybody here. Um, it's in the exercise. If you click in the exercise, then the f in the first paragraph of the exercise should have a link to the background story. Okay, cool. Thanks. I see you after lunch. <laughs>